today on the Strong Women Podcast, we have with us Shanti Feldhahn. And Shanti received her graduate degree from Harvard University and was an analyst on Wall Street before unexpectedly, aren't you excited about finding out what that word means, unexpectedly becoming a social researcher. So this is part of her story that we'll unpack in just a minute. Um, she's also a best-selling author, and she's written several books with her husband, Jeff, and a popular speaker. And um, today, I thought this was an interesting part of her bio. Today, she applies those skills both at home and work and speaking and being an author. Like, she, it's across the board, and I just think that's neat because so, so many times we think our giftings are, like, in a category, but this is something that applies to all the spheres of life. She's able to work it in. So I'm excited to hear more about that. But she's written several books and um, like several, it would take too long to list them all, but we're going to mention a few of them today. So thanks for coming, Shanti. Absolutely. I'm delighted. Okay, Shanti, your name is so original. So I, I actually want to start with you saying, how, where did your name come from, Shanti? Is that a family name? Well, believe it or not, no. It's actually a name from India. My um, parents were in the Peace Corps in India before I was born. And it's a really popular Indian name. And so I confuse a lot of Indians when I meet them. <laughs> because, you know, if I say, hi, I'm Shanti, and they're like, they're like, no, you're like not. That. No, you're not. <laughs> I was once speaking in Singapore and a taxi driver refused to take me because he was waiting for somebody named Shanti. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Okay, so that segues perfect into, we love to start your story where you started and you mentioned your parents. So can you tell us a little bit about the home you grew up in and your parents and, and all that? Yeah, absolutely. I actually was incredibly blessed to grow up in a wonderful family with two awesome parents. Um, I have no, like, you know, some people have these horrible stories of, you know, parents with really difficult situations. And I know you've um, talked to a lot of people with that kind of background. And I am just really, really grateful that um, I grew up in a, a home with uh, a dad who had a PhD in economics and was a Fulbright scholar and was in international development. So he was constantly sort of flying all over the world and helping make sure that people didn't starve because their crops weren't irrigated, basically. Um, and so that's kind of the background that I had. And when I um, grew up and went to college, I got a degree in government and economics and then worked on Capitol Hill. And it was kind of that public service thing, like that's kind of our family. And, um, and then went off to graduate school. And that's where I got um, a very analytical graduate degree and then went to work on Wall Street afterwards. I just, I had no idea that God was sort of setting all that up <laughs> so that I would use that, gra that graduate analytical degree and that background in a completely different way. And my husband is standing behind the webcam and pointing to himself and oh yes at graduate school i met my husband oh yeah most important part <laughs> which is story, way right? more important than any of that yes, so, that's yeah. the most important part <laughs> well wait Sorry, wait Kenny. we gotta go back we gotta go back because i've got several questions um yeah so did were your parents believers were you raised in a christian home they're definitely believers it was very kind of a mainline um church environment where to some degree um, kind of faith was a little more of a private thing. It wasn't kind of the normal, what I think of today as a evangelical environment. But yeah, a church every Sunday, I grew up in youth group, all of that was, they did everything they could to try to instill that in me. It didn't take <laughs> at the beginning <laughs> because I just, it didn't, I don't know why, I just, I wanted my own way, I guess, like many of us do. And um, and so the only reason that I was really in church was because of my parents and um, because I love singing in the choir, like stuff like that. And um, when I went off to college, because it didn't mean anything to me, 
Um, I would have stopped going to church entirely, but God kept me in church because I missed singing and had a group of Catholic Christian friends who invited me to sing in their equivalent of a worship group. And so that's how God kept me in church for all four years of college was through the, the Catholic Christians on campus. And right before I graduated, I came to know the Lord at this Catholic student retreat. And, um, and that's, my story is backwards from some people who sort of feel like they didn't get it in their Catholic church and got it later. And mine is backwards, backwards from that. So after um, I really came to know the Lord, I um, went to a wonderful Bible believing church and then went off to graduate school and met my husband and he had been a Christian for a long time and, <laughs> and was very patient <laughs> with the fact that some of it was kind of new to me. Um, but that was my direction. So it sounds like your dad had a PhD. So was was it kind of instilled in you at a young age to be driven to set some pretty high goals? Because um, I don't know, I'm just thinking about how, you know, when we're younger, it's so foundational. And, and especially as, um, as a woman, you know, so, sometimes we're, we're either encouraged to, you know, shoot for things um, that our mom or dad did, or sometimes it's more like, well, women are supposed to kind of stay in this category of things. Um, so I'm wondering how in you that was, like, how did you see all that, when, especially when you were younger? You know, it's interesting that you ask that because I um, never once had any idea, any concept from my parents that I would do anything other than go to college and do great things, like go off and, you know, be a world leader or whatever. Like that was just the assumption. Like, you know, you go in and do what God puts before you and, um, and he'll, you know, lead you in the direction you should go. And it, it was, it was just assumed that that means being a leader in some way. Um, and so I was never, I don't know if you would call it goal oriented. Like there are some people who like know what they want from a really young age. If you had asked me when I was first starting college, my goal would have been to be on Broadway. Like that, that honestly was more like the direction that I wanted to go. God decided otherwise. <laughs> and so, um, and so I'm like, okay, fine. I'll settle for economics. <laughs> and so drastically different. And, um, but that was the direction he wanted me to go. And to be able to build up that as a skill set on that analytical background um, to be doing that now, using that now um, in a completely different way to help relationships. But yeah, I would never have been able to kind of plan where I am now. That was God setting it up and then having some pretty drastic right hand turns. I think that's interesting because when throughout the stories that we've already heard on the podcast through all these different women that is a common theme where where they're setting out to do something and in their mind they're thinking here is my plan for my life and then of course god shapes that and shifts it in a different way like for example one of our one of our guests was is a marine biologist and she had started off right out of school as a marine biologist working for Disney. Then she started having kids and decided to stay home. But now she's writing books and traveling the world, um, doing some filming stuff, all about using her gifting still. And I just love that God does that. Like we just we just take the next step. We end up learning these things. And sometimes it's completely different. Like in your case, completely different than what you'd set out to do. Well, it's really interesting, too, because I would have been so happy f for the rest of my life working on Wall Street. Like, I loved it. It it was the stuff I was doing was fairly meaningful because it was sort of helping to protect our financial system. And um, it was it was really, really fascinating work, um, which it sounds kind of silly, but it was to me anyway. Um, but interestingly, um, when I, we had to leave New York and 
because my husband's job was just too overwhelming in terms of the number of hours. And I'm like, if we have kids, I kind of want my kids to know what their dad looks like. And so I took a job to running a division of a nonprofit that was working still in business. And this whole thing shifted because we moved to Atlanta and I'm, I could sort of headquarter the nonprofit anywhere. And three months later, I was called out to a board meeting and fired. And like, I, that was not my decision. You know, it was one of those, okay, what are you gonna do now? Absolutely no idea what I'm gonna do. And I didn't realize, I was really devastated. And I didn't realize at the time, but there were things God had to do in me. I had way too much pride. I had way too much of a focus, I guess, on like the prestige of Harvard or New York or whatever. And he could not have entrusted me with this writing and speaking ministry if I still had that pride unchecked. I mean, I think all of us have that to some degree, but I did not know how much I had it. And so that was my big right hand turn which was, okay, you can't do what you thought you were going to do the rest of your life. You're fired. You're done. What are you going to do next? And that's when this whole other life came up. So were there people during that time that spoke truth to you that you like, that, did God use people in your life during that time is what I'm trying to get at. Yes, my husband, very specifically, a few other mentors, very specifically, and some books where there were a couple of books that I read where one of them was talking about just in sort of general, it wasn't even about, the book wasn't even about pride. There was just some references in there about that. And it was like, God was going, that's the reason. <laughs> that's what, that's what had to happen here. And it's sort of the, the psalm, I can't remember which psalm it is, where David says, the bones, you will, the bones you have crushed will rejoice. And it was that concept of, this hurts really bad, <laughs> but okay, Lord, you'll bring something good out of this. What do you want me to learn? And that honestly, from the mentorship of kind of Christian resources, I think had as much to do with it as people. I know that sounds funny, but yeah. Do you remember the names of, of the books? We love to talk about books on the podcast. So do you remember any of those? Oh, books? gosh, I don't remember all of them. I remember Rick Joyner's The Final Quest was one of them. Um, but and that was one of the things because he had felt like this was sort of a book that was an allegory dream, like, you know, kind of a vision of one of the things that God talks about. And, and it was you know, pride being one of them. So, so do you think at, so your pride being the struggle, but do you, do you think also, I'm just wondering if, you know, cause so often we find our identity in what we do, what we accomplish. Um, yeah. The letters behind our names, all of those things. So I'm wondering too, if you at that point really kind of struggled with your identity, were you a mom yet at that point? So you guys had left New York you started working for the nonprofit. Okay, so what was that wrestling like with, I'm assuming you kind of wrestled with, okay, who is Shanti and what is she here for kind of thing? A little bit. I hate to tell you this, but I'm really not as self-reflective as I probably should be. <laughs> <laughs> it was more like, this hurts really bad. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't like it. Get me it's out. <laughs> yeah, it's more like sitting on the sofa and watching movies and eating bonbons for two months. So like that's kind of what it was. I, you know what? I that's wish real, I though. Say, that's just real. I wish I could say there was this, like, deep reflection, who is Shanti, identity seeking. I wish I could say that. It was more like, okay, I guess I need to get a job now you know right. it was it was more that and and part of it was also we didn't have kids yet we actually had a hard time having kids and it took us six years um and so that was kind of in it as well like i can't get pregnant and i don't know what i'm supposed to do it was just a sort of a rudderless mm -hmm. Period. How about another bonbon? That sounds great. How about another bonbon? Exactly. Um, 
And so that was, I, I wish I could say that I was identity seeking, but it was really more rudderless flailing around trying to figure out what was, what I was supposed to do with my life. So. Wait, I want to go back though. Cause you said you loved working on wall street. I did. And that just seems like an alien out there kind of <laughs> job. Like what do those amazingly smart people do? People do. Yes, what do they do with all the numbers and the you know the buzzers <laughs> and things? But um, what did you love about Wall Street? And um, I guess the second part of my question is, as a woman, was it challenging to be on Wall Street? It seems like more of a yes. male atmosphere. Very much so. I'll answer the second one. Uh, first, yeah, it's you. It's an eighty twenty environment, where usually, um, it it's about eighty percent men, twenty percent women. And to make it even more complicated, I was in an international group, so I was working primarily with like Japanese bankers, and so I was always the only woman in the room, and usually the only American in the room, and so that made it even more interesting, like all these senior Japanese men, where the Japanese, Jap Japan is a very patriarchal society, very male driven. And so it's, it is just instinctive for them, they have to work at seeing a woman as an authority figure. And because I actually worked for um, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And so I was usually in an authority figure position. So that was also interesting, because here I am in my, you know, late 20s, blonde American woman telling these Japanese bankers, you know, here's some of the things that we're going to um, need to look at. It was really interesting. It was just a, a sort of a trial by fire a little bit. But I, what I loved about the work was um, it's kind of the same thing I love about what I'm doing today. One of the things it was basically to put it at its most kind of, core. I was a financial analyst. I was looking at the financials of all these large Japanese banks and digging into them and trying to figure out like how much our financial system was exposed to some of the hard things that were happening during the Asian financial crisis um, in the mid to late 90s. And, um, and there was a lot that we had to worry about. And so me kind of being the point person, like we're kind of trusting you, Shanti, if there's something here, that's a problem, we need you to find it. And, um, and I really thrived on that. And I didn't know that that's the same skill set that I would need years later, as I'm trying to put on the detective hat to investigate the things that matter the most or that are most hurting relationships, for example or most helping people thrive in their life or causing obstacles. It's that same kind of investigative thing. So I guess that's one of the ways God made me. So how did you, you talked about this rudderless time after you got fired, not sure what God was doing. Um, so how, what was that journey then back to, kind of, okay, maybe, maybe this is where I'm headed. Um, now I'm sure your kids are starting to come into the picture and that sort of thing. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, it, it, do you guys want the real deal story? I rarely talk um, about this. Yes. I can do the quick version. Are you but, kidding um, me? Real deal. Yes. It's, it's pretty crazy. I mean, I'm just going to tell you, it's pretty crazy. So I didn't have the kids yet. I had just been fired. I was sitting on the couch depressed for two months. Bonbons. Lord, what you eating bonbons? <laughs> what do you want me to do, Lord? And <laughs> I had a friend who kept bugging me about something I had told her. She's a friend from Singapore. Our friends from Harvard are like all over the world. And so she was a Singaporean. And she had asked me, this was early 1998. Eight, so a long time ago, right? And one of the things that I studied on Wall Street was the Y2K issue. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that the topic for our young viewers who are listening, Y2K was when the year 2000 was coming. 
some of you weren't born in that year that are listening. Um, and there was this idea that everything was going to crash when the computers had to flip over to, I mean, that's a very simple way of saying it. Um, look into it, Google it if you want to know more. And so for the financial sector, it was just, it had been a thing for years. Like they have been working on it because everybody knew it had to get fixed. Otherwise there would have been this like financial crash because it just was what it was, you know, it was a technical issue. And, um, and so I had, it had just been one of the risk factors that I looked at with these banks. And my Singaporean friend was like, why to what? And she's a strong believer. And, and she said, is this going to create a problem? I'm like, nobody knows. Like they're working really hard to fix it, but like, you know, it's really, it's two, two years before that anything could happen at this point. We're just, we just need to see. And I said, it annoys me that some people are like, grab the dog, the shotgun and head to the hills. Because if there is a problem, which nobody can know whether there will be, but if there is, like, shouldn't the church be the ones who go in to the problem? Like, shouldn't the church, shouldn't followers of Jesus, it's like there's a hurricane, like the churches go in and help the people who are impacted. And shouldn't that be how we handle something like that or, you know, any other issue? And she kept bugging me to write an article for Christianity Today on that. She's like, oh, my gosh, that's a really important, like, you know, perspective. And she kept bugging me and bugging me and bugging me. I'm not a, I was not a writer. I was not interested in trying to pitch an article to CT. This was way outside my, my lane. And so I kept putting her off. And she asked me to pray about it. And so finally, I promised I would pray about it. And so finally, I'm one day I'm praying about it. I'm like, Lord, see, here's the thing. She's right that it actually is a pretty big deal. I don't like all of the, it's going to be chaos. Grab the dog, the shotgun and head to the hills. And I don't like the people who are saying to ignore it either. Like neither of those solutions is a good one. And so, and so I'm praying about it and going, Lord, the thing is, it's an article in CT isn't enough. Like, this is something that every pastor really needs to be discipling people on and approaching this differently. And this needs to be on every Christian radio program. And that kind of attention to something doesn't happen, you know, unless somebody writes a book. And I'm going to tell you the real deal of what happened is that I'm driving in my car as I'm praying this. And the minute that I said, Lord, that doesn't happen unless somebody writes a book, I, seriously believe I felt the Holy Spirit say, yes, you're supposed to write that book, which is like hilarious because I've never wanted to write a book. I know nothing about publishing. All I know is a few friends who try to get published where it's impossible to get published. But that day was the day in my devotional, I was doing Henry Blackaby's Experiencing God devotional, which is wonderful. And that day I opened up the devotional And he said, we as Christians so often limit God by not responding when he calls us to do something. Because we look at that thing, whatever that thing is, and we say, I can't possibly accomplish that. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to take this as a little like sign from heaven, you know, a pointer. And I'm going to do what in the devotional Blackaby encouraged people to do in that situation, which is, Don't try to figure out how it's going to happen. Just do what you can do. Like take the next step and wait and watch and see if something happens. I'm like, okay, I have years of research on this topic that came down from New York with me. I can pull that out. Like I can physically start outlining a book. But I said, Lord, you're going to have to do the publishing thing because there's no way I can accomplish that. Two days later, I just happened to be introduced to someone who found out that I was working on this. I didn't even want to talk about it because it sounded so stupid. And then I, but I was introduced to this person, found out and they started laughing and they're like, you're not going to believe this. But just last week I was sitting down with a major Christian publisher, listening to them tell me that they really wanted to do a book on a balanced Christian response to the Y2K issue. And if I happened to run across anyone writing a book like that, would I let them know? 
It was crazy. The book was written in just a couple of months, which doesn't happen. It was published three months after that, which also doesn't happen. And it instantly became the number one bestseller in the Christian community and sold 300,000 something copies in the space of just a couple of months. And a lot of pastors told me that God used that at just that time to like wake that up as an idea in their head, like, oh, I can be helping people think about any time that there's an issue, the Christian community needs to be prepared to be a blessing. And that wasn't me, as you can tell, that had nothing to do with me. That was just God deciding to do a trajectory change. I love that story. And I love that um, just that mindset, because the church throughout history has had that mindset. I mean, not always. We often fall in that area, but I'm reading a book right now by Rodney Stark, The Triumph of Christianity. Yes. And do you know? He talks about that a lot. Yes. I mean, okay. Yes. I just have to like nerd out for a second because I love history and I love the way he tells it. But he talks about like when the plague went through the Roman Empire, you probably remember this part. The plague went through the Roman Empire and the pagans would, they were so afraid that all the, all the doctors would run away. As soon as the plague was in the town, the doctors ran away. The All the leaders ran away. And if your family member looked like they were getting this plague, which they think was the smallpox, they would push them out into the middle of the street, which also happened to be the sewer, and leave them. And the Christians said, no. And they stayed, and they took care of each other. And the cool thing is you would think, well, and they probably died. And, so, and they did. Some of them, some did, of them did. But yeah. largely Christians survived what like the, the numbers, which you would remember, and I don't remember numbers, but since you're a statistic, statistical person you'd be like well two-thirds of the people whatever but um a large a large portion of the christians actually survived and brought pagans into the faith as well because of the care and love and so this is not the first time y2k was not the first time and right now is not the first time that the churches had to go it may be risky but there's things in our culture that we should not run from but we should we should help the hurting Exactly. Care. It, I'm so I'm so impressed that you actually had that example. I literally put that example in the book because, but it it points it out, right? Like that eventually led to the Second Great Awakening. That example of people who had been persecuted, right? That example of those people showing that love was so powerful. And so that's a, to me, a starting point for everything. Um, I didn't end up staying in that lane of writing because God did another right hand turn, but that's how I started. You didn't continue in that because I was going to say most of your books are about relationships and you do all this research on men and women. And so you go from studying something like that and hey, church, you know, this is how we can be a light when crisis comes to, um, hey, church, <laughs> we're, men and, we're men and women, and we have to work together um, in harmony and friendship. And this is some of the ways we can do that, which, which I love that because in this podcast, we talk about, um, you know, we're not about pushing down men. Um, just because we are called the Strong Woman Podcast, but we talk a lot about how we are supposed to live in harmony, communi community, friendship with men and build each other up. And that's, I mean, all your resources point in that direction. So where did that, where did that passion come for you? Okay, you're going to laugh, but I, it actually came because I was writing a couple of novels. I had a chance, after all that, I took on a couple of Christian fiction books that I decided to write. And it was, it's a long story, but this whole next phase of my life started because one of the main characters in one of the novels that I was writing was a man. And I didn't know how to put thoughts in his head. <laughs> and it's like, you know, he's like a main character. Like, I can't just say what the main character is doing. I have to say what he's thinking. And he has to but talk like, like, he has to think and talk like a man, not like you, yeah, right? And not like a girl writing yeah. a man's part. Exactly. And I'm like, I have no idea what a guy would be thinking. And some of the situations I was putting him in were really personal. 
And I don't know. And so this whole thing started because I would ask Jeff, my husband, or other guys like we'd be out to dinner with another couple and I'd go to the other husband and I'd say, okay, can I interview you? <laughs> like, here's the scene in the novel. What would you be thinking if this was you? And as these men started telling me what they'd actually be thinking, half the time I'm like, seriously? Like I was so shocked by some of the things I was hearing and did more and more of these, you know, interviews and, <laughs> I know it sounds stupid, but pretty soon I'm going up to the guys behind the counter at Starbucks. <laughs> I'm like, what would you be thinking if this was you? I'm like, who is this lady? I, Wait, I know. are you shocked was... because it's just so different from how you would be thinking? Yeah, well, yes. And it was so surprising. Like, I had no idea. I'd been married probably at that point eight years. And like, why didn't I know this before? I've been married for eight years, right? It, that was part of it. But the other piece of it, I realized it, what really hit me wasn't just that it was surprising. What really hit me emotionally was that this was really foundational to them. Like the things that I was hearing from the men eventually, it, it wasn't something, the stuff that was shocking, that was so surprising, it wasn't just that it happened like, you know, off in a corner once every couple months, like it came up in a guy's mind. No, like the stuff they were describing were things that they thought, things that they felt, things were very deep heart issues that they were had in their minds or in their hearts every single day, like multiple times a day. And this was foundational to who they were and to everything about how they thought in relationships. And it really, first of all, it really convicted me because I personally realized some of the reasons that my husband and I had been having some marital like issues because a lot of it was I was trying really hard to love my husband well and not realizing I was trying hard in the wrong areas and actually kind of trying hard and hurting him <laughs> in some ways that I never intended to. I had no idea I was hurting him and would never want to. And so that is what led to the next right hand turn, um, which is a long story, but God made a way for me to put that analyst hat back on. And I was able to do this big nationally representative survey of men. And all the stuff I'd been finding in the interviews like came out on the survey. Like I hadn't just interviewed, you know, the hundred weirdest men on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but it was really foundational. And that became the book for women only. And just let me, um, let me ask a clarifying question because, yeah. you know, there's the joke when you say, what's a man thinking, you know, it, people kind of joke and it always ends up being something sexual, but that's yeah. not what you're talking mm -hmm. about. You're just talking about the different, just the giftings and different veins that I'll give you an example okay. if you want like okay because this was one of the things that shocked me like that men our men look so you know strong and confident in themselves you know like they they have this demeanor that we think that that's how they feel about themselves uh no it's this huge mask and underneath the mask underneath there's this massive amount of vulnerability, really, and this insecurity and self-doubt that we don't even know is there in the hearts of like our husband or a boyfriend or a son. We have no idea that constantly, it's like this, um, when I would ask the guy, what does it feel like to be a man? Like what's going through your mind? And it was always this sense of like, I wanna, tackle a challenge, right? You know, I want to be great at things. I want to be a great husband or a great dad or a great salesman or, you know, whatever. But I really am not sure that I know what I'm doing and I hope nobody finds out. And, and so it's this raw nerve of insecurity and self-doubt that we don't know is there. And as women, we can hit the nerve because <laughs> we don't realize that it's even there. And it's constant. 
that's an example of something I had no clue about. And it changes everything once you actually know what's going on under the surface. Yeah, so you alluded to, you you actually did two books. One you wrote for women only, and it's about men. And then you wrote with your husband for men only, and it's yeah. about women. Um, but it it is it is so fascinating because you the for women only you really look at how through surveys and research um yeah how men and women do think and and you even talk about their brain our brains and and all kinds mm-hmm. of stuff our brains are wired differently yeah. yeah and i think it's so valuable as women to know that because of like you said i mean that can help us in our relationships with our dads that can help us in our relationships with our coworkers and our dear friends. And especially, I just think as a mom, I have two sons, Sarah has a son, to understand yeah. how we can, um, you know, build them up, not in a false way, but like, and, and, and truly encourage and come alongside the men in our lives that we love and, yeah. and value. Um, it's really, it's really eye opening. Well, for me, the thing, pers- the thing personally that mattered the most to me was thinking, I really like appreciate my husband. I mean, he's a good guy. And most, even though there's issues, most of us do. We do appreciate our husband. We do. We are proud of our son. We are, you know, whatever those, you know, the, the guy that we're dating, we're like, he's kind of nice. Like, there's usually that sense of appreciation. And we have no idea that all day long we're sending the opposite signals and would never intend to. And, and that there's also ways that you can send the positive signals because it is how you feel. You just don't realize what it is that speaks that to them. Just like I can, I might point out that when we did the surveys and the studies of women, that the men are exactly in the opposite boat too. Like, they're like, of course I love you to death. Like, of course, you know, and the woman's all unhappy and feeling like he doesn't love her. And he's like, of course I do. Like he, it's the exact same thing is that we just don't understand what speaks life or death to the other person because they're wired differently than we are. And it's life changing, like radically life changing when your eyes are opened to this, because suddenly you can try hard in the right areas, right? And suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, these little changes can really make this like big difference in the trajectory, which is important for a relationship. It's life changing for like a mom to know these things about her son. It's life changing for a single woman who's always like, why is it that nothing ever goes any further? You know, let me tell you about all the conversations I've had with single men (laughs) about that. And it's usually just for something as tragically stupid as a lack of the right information. And so that's why I'm passionate about that piece of what I do. I think, I think it's so helpful. That tool is so helpful um, in understanding each other because we are different and our differences are beautiful and we're designed mm-hmm. by God. And so, but we are different. So we do have to listen. We have to have that humble posture. Um, so one of our favorite uh, singers is a guy named Dave Wilcox. Uh, ours, I mean, um, John, my husband, John, and I, we love this guy. He's like a singer-songwriter. Have you ever heard of him, Dave Wilcox? I haven't. Anyway, he wrote this song about marriage that I just think is so fantastic. It's called Start With The Ending. And um, it's it's like, listen in the first lines. He says, the secret of a happy marriage, maybe you should write this down. If you want to keep a love together, the best way is to end it now. And what he means is, like, then I'm going to skip ahead. Um, Because if you start with the ending then you've got all, it's all, it's already done. Like now you're just, and what he says is, um, after, after you both decided you were missing something that you need, the ways that you were too short sighted get easier for you to see. And after all the expectations shatter on the kitchen floor, 
you just see another human suffering and you wonder what the war was for. And I just, I love that line. You see another human suffering. And I think yeah. in whatever relationship that we're in, if we can start with that, you, this is another human suffering. So how do we understand them and meet those needs? And so appreciate your work in helping us understand the differences and be able to speak more clearly with the way we talk to each other, the way we interact and affirm each other and all that. Yeah, I that's what I liked about um, your book, Shanti, and because it, it builds in us an appreciation for the design and makeup and um, complexities of yes. the different people in our lives. And and we can appreciate it. And and of course you say in the book and and we'll just mention this now of course we can't like like we had glenn stanton on our podcast and he talked about we can't talk in totalities and, and completely course. comprehensively and you talk about that in the book you say if 78 percent of women do this that means <laughs> 22 percent 22 percent that do not fit that so of course yeah. there are always exceptions but um but it does just encourage in us to, you know, especially as women, we want to be seen for who we are by the men in our lives, whether our dads or our boss or our coworker or our friends. Um, and so this encourages us to really see the men in our lives and really see them and say, oh, okay, so because my dad doesn't say every day, love you, or my husband or my boyfriend, whoever we're talking about. It doesn't mean they don't. It's just they don't, you know, they're not wired necessarily to think they have to like nurture and say that every day. And their thoughts are just so different. And when you when you get a hold of that and start to understand that, then you appreciate the ways that they are different and you're more likely to work alongside them and say, hey, so you think this way, I think this way, and I would love if you told me every day. <laughs> that you love me or whatever, you know, fill in the blank. Exactly. Like, I know you we, don't communicate this way normally, but here's <laughs> what I hear and here's what I need to hear. <laughs> yep. And, and it's so hilarious. Like when we were doing the research on women and then started talking to like marriage conferences and we're telling the men this and they're like, really, really? <laughs> because, because the guys like it's, it really is funny when a guy gets married the question of whether his wife loves him, done. Yeah, check. Like I'm there's a yes. switch that switches. Like it's like, okay, now I feel permanently loved. I'm good. And on to the next thing. <laughs> and, and so we tell the men, there is no switch in a woman's brain that gets flipped to the, oh, now I feel permanently loved position. Like, you know how you as a guy have this insecurity about, and, and just, you know, the insecurity that men have, the self-doubt that I was talking about earlier, it's a very specific insecurity. It's, am I any good at what I do, right? Am I adequate? Am I able? Am I good at what I do? For women, we tell them, that's not necessarily our insecurity. We actually kind of think we are good at what we do. <laughs> Usually, like, we think we know how to handle things. And the insecurity that we have is, am I lovable? Like, am I special? And that's the question that's always there for us. So there's no switch where that gets flipped permanently off. I have that question every day, even after I get married. And I need to know the answer every day. And it's usually little stuff. And the guys are so thankful to learn that it's not like that I need to arrange a candlelight dinner every two days, that it's literally a signal that I would choose you all over again every day, like taking your hand when you walk across a parking lot. That says, I would choose you all over again. And, and the guys are like, oh my gosh, A, I had no idea, and B, I can do that. <laughs> and so, I mean, again, it's such little simple stuff. So quick question on that about how men are their their insecurity is kind of in am I good at what I do how do yeah. how do we as women step on that and hurt them in that way the most like in your research what was kind of like this is what the moms wives girlfriends daughters 
do to the men in their yeah. life and and kind of hurt them in that way hit that nerve I, I... <laughs> Okay, I'll give you a couple of examples. And they're okay. all little. Like, you're going to go, what? Do you ever come <laughs> along behind your husband and put the dishes in the dishwasher the right way? Mm. That would <laughs> you mean know? you'd have to put the dishes in the dishwasher. Dishes in the dishwasher. <laughs> okay, exactly. <laughs> it's like little things. Like, mm -hmm. he cleans the kitchen, and you come along around behind him and clean it because he missed the crumbs under the toaster. Or... He's got the kids on a Saturday afternoon while you go out with girlfriends and you give him a list of what to do, like every, you know, half an hour. And all of these things, these are little things. You, you say, why did you not put the coats on when the kids were running around outside in the cold? The, all these things say something that is minor for us that we don't think of as a big deal. Like, I'm just trying to help, right? <laughs> And for him, it's saying, uh, no, what you did, it wasn't good enough. You failed. And it seems so, like, so oversensitive. Like, that shouldn't bother him. And finally, I thought that over and over as I was listening to these men and doing the interviews and the focus groups and the surveys. And finally, it was like God whacked me over the head. And I'm like, look, the reason I'm saying that should not bother you. Like, you're so oversensitive. Grow up. <laughs> The reason that I'm saying that is that it wouldn't bother me. And he's wired so differently. And so the, the thing that we realized is that you can hit that raw nerve with anything that says, I think what you just did was inadequate. That's it. It's little signals. What you just tried to do was inadequate. And it's because that's his insecurity that's also the great like positive power that you can show him how you do feel. We found that it took us a while. We had to go on a bit of a quest <laughs> in our in our research, but we we realized that wait a minute, if a man's insecurity isn't whether he's lovable, I the words I love you speak life to us, but to him it's just like nice, you know? It doesn't really speak that same thing and so we finally figured out what does and believe it or not just saying thank you like noticing what he did because again it's all about what he did noticing that he did the dishes and saying thank you is this life-giving thing and it's so simple for him for your sons right like for it for a guy that you're interested in it's just it's dramatic. <laughs> it's really dramatic. Okay, you're you're stepping on my toes here, Shanti, because <laughs> I'm I'm thinking about how my husband has actually said to me repeatedly, "You just have to say th like all I want you to say is thank you. You don't have because what I'll do sometimes yeah. is like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get to the dishes, or I'm sorry I didn't do that, and you had to do it, da da da. And he's like, I was happy to do it. All you have to say, you can just say thank you. You don't have to apologize yeah. or or anything like that. And so I'm thinking about the power of, of saying thank you and what that communicates of like, hey, I saw what you did and I appreciate yeah. it. And this and is, I think, good. where, and it's good. And I do think as women, we can struggle with um, thinking that the way we do things is the best way, especially in the marriage relationship when, when kids yeah. come in and you're running the house and so you just think well i just do kind of do it better and we <laughs> we kind of puff ourselves up right we kind of do there's that yeah again back to that it is well the the interesting thing that i realized somewhere along the way when i first because again remember when i first stumbled over this i was like oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh like i do this every day right and it explains some of the reasons why you know there were some hard seasons in our marriage every now and then and um I mean it wasn't just me there were things he didn't know either but that on my side certainly explained a few things and and the the thing that I realized in the middle of that research that very first research project is this was this revelation that oh my word we women we kind of think we're the ones who are good at relationships like we kind of think we're the ones with the interpersonal skills. 
And what that translates to subconsciously is that means if there's a problem, it's his fault. And he just has to learn to relate better. And kind of this eye-opening, whoa, the way that God has wired men to relate is totally legitimate. It's just often totally different. And kind of that we think we know better. I mean, there's just so much of that in us where we think we're kind of the default for the ones that do relationships well. I hate to say that out loud, but kind of. I really hate for that you're saying that us. out loud because now I have to pray about that. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but it's, it is, it's really dramatic once you go, wow, maybe the way God has wired him to relate is completely legitimate. And I have to, learn that too, and see the ways that I'm hurting him without intending to, or not sending that message of how much I appreciate him. We found in one of our studies, we found that when we surveyed um, women, and it was, we this was the case for both men and women, but on the women's side specifically, we asked people, how often do you think that you say, um, words of praise or affirmation? Like, what's what's your standard? And people think of the average is that we think that we say those things like thank you, right? We think we say that about two to three times a day to our spouse or our son or whatever. And then we had them measure it. And they realized on average, it's actually two to three times a week. Whoa. Because it's in our oh, head. It's in yes. our head. Yeah. And we're thinking, oh, that's so nice of him. Oh, wow, he handled the kids so well. Wow, he's so kind. Or whatever. Or, you know, the son, he let his sister play with the whatever. Oh, that's so sweet of him. And we think it, and it often just never makes it out of our mouth. And so this life-giving thing, which, of course, everybody wants affirmation, right? That's not just a male thing. <laughs> everybody loves being affirmed. And this life-giving thing that we have to give isn't being given as often as we think. Yeah, that, man, this is making me sweat. But I, <laughs> I, <laughs> you're saying it though, Shanti, and I know, I know it's true. And, and I know as parents, my husband and I have tried to be more purposeful in like catching our kids doing good. But this is what you're talking about. It, and not living in a way where we just expect people to do what we want them to do. And so we have this expectation, well, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And so then we don't articulate the thank yeah. yous and the I, I appreciate you or I saw that. And so even, um, you know, in my years of staying home with the kids and my husband being the sole, uh, you know, financial breadwinner in our family, of just even stopping sometimes and saying, I appreciate all yeah. that you do because I love when he does that for me. Yeah. And, and with my kids, like you said, like saying to my son, you know, where I, uh, with the boys, it's always like, be gentle, be gentle with your sisters, you know. But when you see them being gentle, saying, that was so sweet what you did and, and stopping and saying thank you. And that thinking that we say it, oh yeah, I say it two or three times a day. I, I think I would answer that way too. Yeah. So that's- It's, it's eye-opening. Yeah. It really, really is eye-opening. Yeah. And, and the thing I will tell you that is amazing is to watch the difference. First of all, the difference it can make in your marriage. Just, it's so simple. Like this isn't rocket science. And yet it's just, there's some dramatic changes when you stop trying to say, when you stop yourself from saying the things that are being perceived as like sucking the life out of him, like he, you wouldn't see it that way, but that's the way he feels it. Like I'm no good at what I did, tried to do for her. When you just stop trying to do those things and start trying to do the things that convey that positive message, it's, it's life changing for the relationship. But it's because your sons are still growing in their identity of themselves, it's like eternally transformational for them. 
because that's part of their self kind of concept, really. There's a whole lot of stuff about childhood development here. And one of the projects that we did was studying, you know, how kids feel about themselves. And one of the things that was powerful for me when my son, we were doing this project when my son was three, from the time that he was three to six was this particular research project. And I started to see how much like saying thank you and affirming him, I started to see it in the numbers like, wow, okay, that's a really big deal for guys. I need to make sure he knows I feel that way about him because that's him developing. And it's been fascinating, like literally telling him thank you for when he was a little boy and his chore was to start helping with the dishes. And of course he didn't do it very well at the beginning because he's a little boy, right? Like, so the dishes get stacked on top of each other and there's no way they can get clean, but still saying thank you. And then the next day saying thank you again yesterday, let me show you how you can do it even better, right? And, and knowing that it's gonna sting a little, but let me show you how you can do it even better and watching him grow in that. And then now my son is 18 years old. And I swear to you, I'm not even kidding. My husband was standing here. He would tell me this. He would tell you the same thing. If my son hears the sound of me clanking the dishes and taking the dishes, you know, putting them in the dishwasher or taking them out of the dishwasher, he is in from the living room. Can I help? Like it's not his chore. But he wants to help because he's he knows he's something he's good at and he can help me. And I've told him how much I appreciate that. It's really I know this sounds so simple, but it's really powerful. So, OK, on that note, Shanti, you mentioned your son who's 18. We always like to ask our guests about this younger generation coming up and what advice you would have for them. So. You've done all this re research in relationships, but maybe even thinking back to when you were your son's age or, or in high school. And um, if you could talk to college student Shanti um, and and the young women growing up in today's culture, what what is some advice you would give to them? Well, I, I also have a 21 year old daughter and um, and when I saw that you wanted to ask that question, I was thinking about it because it's a powerful question, really, like what's some of the most important advice? And there's there's two things. One is what we've been talking about. Like if I go and speak at a college, like I love going to speak at colleges. And I always tell the students, like if I'm speaking at a Christian college and there's a college chapel, I say something and they kind of roll their eyes, but it's true. Where I say, look, if you will listen to what I'm about to tell you, this can change the course of your life because what I share is this thing about that there are these differences. And if you can have your eyes open and be curious about the differences, it will set you up well for the rest of your life. And suddenly everything else just goes better once you understand that these are ways we've been created differently. And so that's the first thing that I would say to a young woman who's kind of college age. But the second thing I'd say is an implication of that, which is also don't buy in to the cultural belief that's running under the surface today that if, you know, the cultural belief is that there's no differences between men and women or that gender is fluid or, you know, whatever which the translation of that means there's nothing unique about you. Don't buy into that. You are uniquely created to be a young woman who, yeah, during high school, during college, there's a lot of questions and changes and challenges and who am I kind of things. And the thing that I, I always would want to tell women is young women is there is something very unique about you. Keep walking this road and keep trusting God, even when you feel very confused and like, I don't know where my place is. I don't know where I fit. And God will show you that he will develop you into the woman that you're supposed to be. And so that to me is those two are two sides of the same coin. 
is learning this stuff will transform your life and your relationships from this point on, but it can also transform your heart because then you realize, wow, I really am created unique. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay. The next question is, um, are you a reader? I think you're a reader. Um, what yeah. books are you reading right now? Okay. You're going to laugh. My books that I write are nonfiction relationship books, and I don't read the type of books that I write. <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds bad, but like, I love fiction. I'm a, I'm a novel reader okay. myself. And so I'm uh, just starting again. I've read it before, but I'm just starting again. Ready Player One. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not a Jane Austen kind of girl. I'm so sorry. Like adventure stories. That's adventure me. Adventure stories. Okay, that's good. Yeah. You don't have to apologize for that. <laughs> I know that kind of makes sense because you're analytical and all your research for your book. So I, it actually makes sense that you're like, take me away. <laughs> Uh -huh. Give me a break from, give me a break from yep. the real world and let's, yep. let's develop my Pretty imagination. Much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Last question, Shanti is if you could have coffee with any woman in history, who would you choose? Okay. The way you worded the question when you sent it to me was that it could be a fictional person too. Sure. It could totally it be? could. Yes. Okay. Cause that's not history. That's like fiction. Yes. Well, we've but, had we've had women choose fictional characters before, okay. so you are totally allowed All to right. do that. All right, because everybody otherwise the people would go, uh, you know that that's not a real person. Yes. <laughs> wrong. But but one of my favorite books is the Mark of the Lion series by Francine Rivers. Mm. Oh, and it is really powerful, and it mm -hmm. starts with the fall of Jerusalem. It's historical fiction. And it starts with the fall of Jerusalem and a young Christian girl who's taken captive as a slave. And she grows in her faith. And it's this whole incredible story over the course of several books. And her name is Hadassah. And I was when I saw your question of, could you have coffee with any woman, even if it's a fictional character? I'm like, I would love to have coffee with this girl, Hadassah. Because by the time when you read these books, and some of your your viewers, your listeners, um, I'm sure are familiar with these books, but and I'm sure they'll think the same thing that I have is that by the time you're partway through these books, this girl has gone through so much, and she's shining for the Lord so much in such a dark situation that you're like crying and going, I know I want to be like Jesus, but I want to be like Hadassah. <laughs> And so that's immediately what came to mind. Well, so. and there's actually church history figures like that, like Blandina and is it Perpetua or whatever. Like those are the, exactly. those are great models. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Shanti, for spending this time with us. We've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm glad. Thanks for the chance to share. <laughs> <laughs>